Japan is one of the biggest animation hubs in the world, but how did it get to this point? Let's take a look. The Unsung Beginnings the earliest record of a Japanese-made animation was discovered in Kyoto back in 2005, a three-second film referred to as Katsudu Shashin, estimated to be as old as 1907. Other works were found that can be traced to the late 1910s. Unlike the rest of the world, the style that was most prevalent back then was a paper cut style, otherwise known as cutter animation, with works such as Namakura Gatana, telling the story of a less than competent samurai purchasing a sword, and Urushi Mataro, that covers the titular protagonist's adventure under the ocean. Both were heavily praised by the Japanese pure art movement, created to modernize Japanese cinema and art at the time, as it could promote Japanese culture outside of Japan. And that's as far back as readily available records go, as in 1923, tragedy struck. The devastating Kanto earthquake resulted in heavy losses. The disaster itself and subsequent fires resulted in the destruction of most of Japan's early movies and animations. Not all hope is lost, however. From the ashes, quite literally, rose studios, and with them one specific story that would forever change the manner animation was viewed in Japan. The Mountain, where old women were abandoned, was an animated short depicting the folktale of people abandoning the elderly in a mountain once they become too old to serve society. It was praised for its moral message. This one art piece caught the eye of the Ministry of Education, thus anime began receiving government funding. The Ministry of Education would become a patron, consistently commissioning animated projects. There is another art form that is synonymous with Japan, and that is manga. We won't get into how manga came into prevalence, but we do get to see its influence on animation, even back then as works like The Pot began introducing speech bubbles as voiceover wasn't prevalent yet. Another aspect synonymous with this period were unstable world politics. Uh, propaganda was a common occurrence and unfortunately tainted most art forms. We won't get into that here, as we would rather instead cover the positive things that came out from Japanese animators, such as Disease Spreads, which is your run-of-the-mill infomercial, The Story of Tobacco, one of the earliest records of compositing, which is combining live action and animation, as well as the story of the Monkey King, which is a retelling of the Journey to the West epic, which, as we all know, served as an inspiration point for one of the most infamous IPs today, Dragon Ball. The period also gave rise to some legendary names, such as Noburu Ofuji, with a ridiculously long filmography that almost spans four decades, with works such as Burglars of the Baghdad Castle and A Ship of Oranges. Before we continue, let me tell you about Skillshare, which is a platform that has hundreds of classes about animation, drawing, illustration, and several other creative fields. We've got you guys this course from Skillshare about Procreate that will teach you how to create watercolor art. The course is mainly designed for intermediates who know some basics about Procreate. It is taught by Inga Yoon who will teach you everything you gotta know about creating watercolor art. You will learn different stuff such as how to create textured paper, how to add semi-transparent watercolor elements, and how to sketch and many more stuff. The Skillshare platform offers a wide variety of additional related courses and the first 1000 people to click the link in the description will receive a free month of premium membership. Alright, now back to the video. Disney and the rise of cell animation while the cutter animation style was still seeing wide usage in Japan, a little-known company over in the West was seeing their fair share of success as well. Uh, Disney has already refined the cell animation style and would release its first ever feature-length fully colored animated film as early as 1937. The influence of Disney can be spotted almost immediately. Three years after the release of Steamboat Willie, Ugoke Kore no Takeiki would come out with clear influence drawn from Western animation. This period was unfortunately Fortunately, not free from worldwide conflict, and would yet again see a lot of the animated works produced as propaganda. The first ever full-length Japanese animated movie would be a result of this phenomenon. In 1945, Momotaro's Divine Sea Warriors would be released as Japan's first animated feature film, as well as one of the first projects to be fully voiced. Up to this point, voices were viewed as non-essential in anime because of the prevalence of benshi, or silent film narrators. This job would eventually become obsolete, and most of the Benshi would move on to become voice actors. 
And not to be outdone, in the same year as the release of Snow White, Japan would make their first fully colored animation called Princess Katsura. At a fraction of the runtime, mind you, five minutes to be exact, it even included a behind the scenes look at how it was made. In 1948, Japan's animation studio would be founded. It would remain uneventful until 1956, where Toei would acquire the studio and rebrand to Toei Animation, the Toei Animation. And they would waste no time in coming out with the first fully colored feature length film, Propaganda Free, I might add, in the form of Hakujaten, two years later in 1958. The 1960s and the birth of anime's most iconic genres. The decade would kick off by Usamu Tekuza leaving Toei Animation and founding his own Mushi Production Studio. This name might be familiar, as it should, since this man would move on to creating some of the most influential anime titles. He is most well known for Astro Boy. This show would set the standard for anime at the time. With the prevalence of only a few studios and with the background of animated TV series being mostly a blank slate, we would see the emergence of some of anime's most iconic genres in this decade. Tetsujin 28 Go, also known as Gigantor, would be the first mecha anime ever produced. 1965 would see the release of Kim by the White Lion, other than sounding very close to Simba despite the Lion King releasing decades later, this was the first fully colored TV anime. It would also be one of the first Japanese animated series to reach the mainstream, as it would air in many different countries. This decade also gave us Sally the Witch, one of the first magical girl anime, and last but not least, Cyborg 001 would also start airing as one of the first Japanese multi-decade spanning franchises. The Golden Age of Anime, 1970s to the year 2000. The 70s would see Mushi Productions close. An unfortunate loss, but a necessary one. Most of its staff moved on to create another industry giant in the form of Madhouse. This is where anime genres would start solidifying themselves, along with the inception of some of anime's most iconic titles. Mecha anime would explode in popularity with Mazinger Z being a foundation for the genre. We would see names like Macross and Gundam enter the fray. The 80s would bring the rise of another very popular genre in the form of sports anime, Captain Tsubasa being one of the most successful. This decade would also see the release of the Dragon Ball anime, which would shape the entire shonen genre. Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind would mark the beginning of Studio Ghibli, which would move on to create some of anime's best and most iconic movies. We would also see some more experimental projects such as Akira and Grave of the Fireflies hit the waves. The 90s would bring about some of the biggest franchise names such as Sailor Moon, Cowboy Bebop, and even Pokemon. Satoshi Kon would rise to prevalence as a director with works such as Perfect Blue, and these titles would bring about the iconic art style referred to as 90s anime, still prevalent to this day as an endearing term of nostalgia. This success would carry over to the 2000s with some of anime's longest running titles including Shonen Jump's Big 3 in Naruto, One Piece, and Bleach becoming global phenomena. So, where's anime now? Anime is doing better than ever. Incredible new studios rose to fame, and the long-staying names still produce mind-boggling works. The evolution of technology allowed for infinitely better quality at a fraction of the budget and time, and we still have new titles releasing every year. Riddled with hardship, the road for Japanese anime to become what it is today was beyond treacherous, but it remains an incredible story for a medium that has shaped and is still shaping generations to come. Thanks for watching! We hope you found this video insightful. If you did, be sure to let us know in the comments below, leave a like and a sub and all of that fun stuff, and we'll catch you next time. Cheers! <laughs>